Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And welcome back to another one of these Skyrim investigative videos, where we break down an Elder Scrolls V related mystery or theory to its fullest extent and try to consider all of the evidence possible. Not only over-examining the game itself, but also the game's files and other sources beyond. Anyway, today I'd like to tackle what I'd personally consider to be the biggest and strangest unanswered question related to Skyrim's Thieves' Guild. As there's a certain member of the faction, whom, at face value, appears to be relatively forgettable and looks like little more than a filler character, that actually has a past shrouded in ambiguity, and he may very well be related to one of the biggest unexplained events in Elder Scrolls history. This is a topic we've briefly explored before for a couple of minutes in a previous list, but an entire video gives us the opportunity to go over what we missed. And the research since then, as well as additional Elder Scrolls content that's released, has resulted in some unexpected discoveries. So, without any further ado, let's do further. Alrighty, meet Rune. This is the man our story centers on today. He's a member of Riften's Thieves' Guild, that by all appearances is as generic as a character gets. Like most everyone else in his faction, he lives at the guild's headquarters, beneath the city in Riften's Ratway sewers, and specifically dwells in the Cistern, an area of the tunnels that we the player can only access if we've at least completed the Thieves' Guild's first couple of missions. So we can't even interact with Rune unless we've gotten started with the quest line. Now, for the most part, he just kind of hangs around the Cistern and vibes a bit. Like, that's everything he does. That's his entire purpose in the game. Rune has no role in any quests, nor do any of his colleagues even talk much about him. However, once we've joined the guild as a new recruit, we can speak to him, and he does have some unique dialogue, if not a lot. Take a listen. No idea what my birth name really is, and frankly, I don't care. Being brought up by a poor family, I had to learn how to steal if I wanted to make ends meet. Ringyolf actually caught me trying to pick his pocket in the market. If he was anyone else, I would have gotten away with it. I'm glad Ringyolf decided to let me join. Been trying to make some coin for him ever since. Okay, so it's not even a dialogue tree or anything fancy. But in these brief statements, Rune reveals a lot about his past. He tells us he's an orphan with no knowledge of his birth parents that he was raised by a fisherman, and that he got started with the guild after he was caught trying to steal from one of its members, who was apparently rather impressed and invited him to join. For now, this is quite literally all we're able to know about him. However, later on in the guild's quest line, after we've completed a few missions, Rune will get a full dialogue tree, and will be able to learn even more. I've never seen anyone with skills like yours. I just wanted to let you know that if you need anything, you can talk to me. My father told me he found me as a young boy, in the wreckage of a ship that sank off of the coast near Solitude. All he found in my pocket was a tiny smooth stone inscribed with some sort of strange runes. No one does. I've even taken the damn thing to the College of Winterhold. I must have spent every last coin I've made with the guild trying to find out what it means. Perhaps, they could be nonsense, inane scribbles done by someone in idle boredom. But if not, if they actually mean something, they might tell me where I'm from, what ship I was on, everything. Actually, the fisherman who found me, the man I call my father, gave it to me. Thought it was fitting, I suppose. I never changed it because it never felt right to do so. I appreciate that. This is even more revealing. The man was apparently just found in some ship wreckage by a fisherman, with nothing but a tiny stone in his pocket that had some strange runes on it. The generous fisherman took him in and decided to name him after the rock. Now, Rune emphasizes that he's virtually spent his entire life trying to unravel his past, and he's definitely not lying, because on a cupboard in the cistern, we can find a letter that was written to Rune by a private investigator he hired. It reads, Quote, Rune, 
I've used every source at my disposal, and I still can't find a trace of your parents. Whoever they are, they've completely erased themselves from history. This is quite a feat, considering the quality of my sources. If I come up with anything else, I'll be certain to contact you. Signed, Athel Newberry. Huh. Remember, Rune also claims to have reached out to the College of Winterhold and various other institutions about the stone in his pocket. And now we know that not even actual private detectives he's hired are able to find a trace of his family. Clearly, this is no ordinary disappearance. This wasn't just a boy who survived an ordinary shipwreck with his family. Something bigger is at play here. Sadly, this is largely where our trail runs cold. At least in Skyrim. There are no more letters or dialogue pertaining to the mystery. Rune doesn't say anything else. If we ourselves wander all over the coasts of Solitude, where the boy was apparently found, while we can encounter a shipwreck or two, none of them are very special, or contain any references to this debacle. Now, I'm going to argue that there are some very strong connections to two other Elder Scrolls games, specifically Oblivion and ESO that we can identify, and they fuel some compelling theories, but before we dive into that, I'd first like to talk about what seems to be the community consensus that has developed around this topic. Most of the people who seem to be posting about this unanswered question on various forms, and even the people I talk to, believe that Rune's story may be related to cut content. And this is actually what I thought was true for a while as well. Maybe the reason why Bethesda left us on such a cliffhanger was because they originally intended to do more with Rune's story and explain it, but ultimately chose not to. Maybe due to a lack of time, or just a decision to change the narrative. This has always made sense to me. There's a lot of cut content in Skyrim. But after spending quite a few hours running through the game's files with a handful of modders who understand Skyrim's creation kit better than myself, I can confidently say that certainly isn't the case. There is no evidence Bethesda cut anything related to Rune at all. In our time scanning, we found no quest markers, no unused assets, no lingering unused dialogue scripts, nothing at all. Whenever the devs cut content, they always leave behind a mountain of stuff in the files. And there's not the least of that here. Okay, so if Rune's tale is being told exactly the way Bethesda intended, then what could the truth be? Well, let's start by talking about that odd stone Rune was allegedly found with that gave him his name in the first place. While annoyingly, we never get a chance to see it, making the task of analyzing it very difficult, According to Rune, it was small, smooth, and had strange runes, or markings on it, that no one's ever been able to translate or identify. When I first heard this description of the rock, I had immediately assumed that maybe those strange symbols could be writing in Daedric, or Dovazul, or even Dwarven. It makes some sense, none of those languages are well understood by the common folk. However, considering the fact that Rune took this rock to experts all over the world, including folks at the College of Winterhold, who literally study this kind of thing for a living, I'm willing to bet it's none of those languages. It's something totally different. I think what Rune may have is something called a Rune Stone. I know, very creative. So, for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept, Rune Stones are an object that was introduced with the Elder Scrolls Online, which released years after Skyrim. They appear as small stones, with a mysterious type of writing engraved in them, perfectly matching what Rune from the Thieves' Guild claims to possess. Admittedly, it's a vague description, though. In ESO, Rune Stones can be collected from nodes that spawn in the wild, and a few are even sold by enchanters. They play a pretty big role in the game's enchanting system, and can help us create a variety of powerful enchanted gear. Frustratingly, though, Esso doesn't really explain these rune stones very well, or offer us with a whole lot of lore. They mostly feel like a gameplay mechanic. There is a single book we can find written by a member of Esso's Mages Guild called The Enigma of Rune Stones that does acknowledge the mysterious nature behind the rocks, and claims their origin and text are very uncertain. 
The book states that some people believe runestones were already on Tamriel well before the arrival of any elves or humans at all, tens of thousands of years ago in the Marethic Era. Literally before anybody started recording history. The text also points out that other scholars suspect runestones could have been the result of a magical experiment gone wrong by early elven civilizations on Tamriel, also way back in the Marethic Era. So while these rocks from ESO almost perfectly fit the verbal description of rune stone were given in Skyrim, I mean, heck, they're called rune stones, they sound so similar, this connection still fails to explain so much. We still don't know who Rune's parents were, what happened to them, how come no one can figure out? Heck, why would Rune have a Rune Stone rock to begin with? So much is still left vague. Another theory that's been proposed, which would explain quite a bit more, alleges that one of Rune's parents could have been the Grey Fox. So this idea would have some huge significance on the Elder Scrolls' lore. But before we break that down, I should probably explain who the Grey Fox actually is. The Grey Fox is the title given to whomever dons the Grey Cowl of Nocturnal, an artifact of the Daedric Goddess of the Night, Darkness and Luck. Legend has it that the cowl was stolen from the Goddess Nocturnal personally by a gifted thief named Emmer Dareloth some time long ago. After stealing the cowl, Dareloth went on to found the Thieves' Guild and become its first Grandmaster and the Guildmaster in Cyrodiil, taking on the title the Grey Fox. Future leaders of the Guild would have the cowl passed down to them, as well as that title. The thing about the Grey Cowl is that its power causes its wearer to completely lose their identity and who they were before putting on the mask. Wearers lose most of their memories, personality traits, etc. It effectively makes you into a new person. Not only that, but it even erases any memories other people may have had of you. So not only would you forget your family, for instance, but your family would even forget you. The result of this is that people who wear the Grey Cowl just sort of disappear and fully immerse themselves in the Grey Fox persona. Quick note, I should clarify, while the Thieves' Guild has since grown to have chapters in every province across Tamriel, each one independently run by its own guild master, the Grey Fox is implied to be the overall leader of the entire organization. By the time the events of the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion kick off, the Grey Fox currently running the guild is a man named Corvus Umbranox, an imperial noble and count of the city of Anvil. Much of Oblivion's guild's later questline revolves around this man's struggle with balancing his two identities. He wants to be the leader of the guild and lead it to glory, but he also doesn't want to lose who he was. And long story short, Corvus ultimately decides that losing his old identity and connections to his family is just too much. So he surrenders the cowl to the player and makes you the new Grey Fox and Guildmaster before returning to his old life. Perhaps, after the events of Oblivion, the cowl could have found its way to someone other than the player character, and that person could have been Rune's old mother or father. I find this especially likely, because in Oblivion, we're constantly told that the cowl quote-unquote erases its wearer from history. Like, seriously, that phrase, erases you from history, is used repeatedly. And, if you remember the note Rune had sent to him by that detective, Athel Newberry, the detective explicitly states that it's almost like Rune's parents, quote, erased themselves from history. This could be a coincidence, but I think this is very important to point out. Could it be that one of, or both of Rune's parents, really did just that, and erased themselves? It's possible that maybe his mother passed away at childbirth, and his father donned the cowl and left him not long after. In Skyrim, the fate of the Grey Fox is otherwise left totally untouched by Bethesda. The Riften chapter we do business with is led by its guildmaster, Mercer Frey, who's a nutcase in his own right. But there are no references at all to a higher-up Grandmaster, or Fox. Admittedly, in Mercer Frey's house, there's actually an item called the Bust of the Grey Fox, which is a stone bust of the Grey Fox, what it sounds like, but it has no significance in the game. All we can do is pick it up and sell it. 
As you can probably already tell, I'm a big fan of this theory. I think it makes so much sense and seems like just such a cool story. Though, I still have to concede it has its problems. Firstly, it does nothing to elaborate on why he would have been found with that runestone, which is a huge part of the mystery. And what I find even more damaging to this idea are some of the releases, or really one of the releases, on Skyrim's Creation Club. Yes, I know everyone's favorite, totally not controversial microtransaction marketplace. Alas, on November 20th of 2019, a new mod was added to the Creation Club, called The Grey Cowl Returns, priced at 250 credits, or roughly $2.50. This purchase offers exactly what its name implies, allows players to complete a very short quest in Skyrim in order to obtain The Grey Cowl of Nocturnal from Oblivion. And the quest we're given completely contradicts the theory I presented earlier. The mission alleges that the current Grey Fox during the events of Skyrim isn't Rune's dad or mom or something like that. Instead, it's a random wealthy Nord named Piofter, who before donning the Grey Cowl and becoming the new Grey Fox, was apparently at the head of a large and powerful Nord clan called the Ice Blades. In his journals, Piofter expresses great regret for leaving behind the Ice Blades to become the Grey Fox. He says that in his absence, his sister, who was totally unprepared for leadership, rose to the helm. And sadly, she was assassinated. He blames her death on himself. Now, all he wants to do is give up the cowl and return to his old clan and raise his sister's son, who she left behind. Thus, he ends up offering the hood to the Dragonborn and we get to become the new Grey Fox. At least, that's how the creation works out. If this quest holds up as canon, if Bethesda decides it is narratively correct, it totally debunks our earlier theory. The good news is that there's still a very vibrant debate regarding whether or not anything on the Creation Club should be considered canon. When asked on their forms, various Bethesda community managers and representatives have said that they try to make Creation Club content lore-friendly, but they don't want to comment on whether or not it will be canon. Evidently, not even they know, so this is all up in the air. Maybe this quest holds true and debunks my previous theory, or maybe it's not even considered when they write the next game, and Rune's parents may still very well be a gray fox. Alright. So this is where I had originally intended to end the video back when I was working on its script. I wanted to talk about Rune, explain that the stone he had was probably a Rune stone from ESO, and then discuss the Grey Fox theory. But before I was able to finish narrating this video, I stumbled across one last piece of information relating to those Rune stones that I'd like to share with you. You see, on the Elder Scrolls Online's development team at ZeniMax Online Studios, there's a single man called the Lore Master. His entire job is to keep track of Elder Scrolls lore and help develop stories for the franchise moving forward. Prior to 2019, the Elder Scrolls' Lore Master was a man named Lawrence Schick. And oh my gosh, everyone absolutely loved him. The dude was incredibly engaged with the community, and clearly loved and was passionate about the universe as a whole. Well, one of the traditions he started was creating a web series called The Loremaster's Archive, that would be published to ESO's website periodically. The Loremaster's Archive was essentially a giant Q&A, where players could ask Lawrence all sorts of questions about the Elder Scrolls' lore, history, and mysteries. The catch was that Lawrence wouldn't respond to these questions as Lawrence. Instead, he'd adopt the persona of one of the Elder Scrolls' characters, and pretend to respond on behalf of them. For example, in one issue of the Archive, he took up the persona of Abner Tharn, the leader of the Empire's Elder Council, the Grand Chancellor, and went on to respond to all sorts of questions about Imperial government and rule. Anywho, in one issue, Lawrence took up the identity of the guy who authored the book, The Enigma of Runestones, and a player asked him a question about what those stones actually are. This was Lawrence's response. Remember, in this response, he's assuming the identity of the author of that book. Quote, 
The rune names clearly form a language that is coherent and consistent, if limited. The question is, what language is it? This is where we begin to run out of answers, as the rune language seems to derive from no known historic or pre-dawn culture. My personal best guess is that it is a language that was entirely invented by some Dawn-era enchanter, or school of enchanters, who left no other record of their existence than the spread of runestones across Tamriel. The Dawn era was, of course, basically prehistoric Tamriel, before elves or nords ever arrived. This response, though, does appear to clarify that the stones are very, very old and have advanced writing on them. Maybe Rune's parents were collectors of these objects, or had some sort of plan for them and were going out looking for them. Or perhaps one simply fell into his family's possession and they kept it as a collectible. It's not an especially climactic or satisfying conclusion, but it does allude to the possibility that long before Men and Myrrh arrived on this continent, there was an advanced race of individuals doing quite a bit of enchanting. Who they were, the Elnafe, now extinct beast peoples, that's unclear, but maybe they're the source of Rune's great frustration. Whatever the case, this is where we are going to end today's video. The Curious Case of Riften's Orphaned Thief. Thank you so much for stopping by, everybody. What do you think is really going on here? Is it cut content? Is Rune's father the Grey Fox? Something else? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.